Well, good morning. Please, please sit down. I was just having dinner with Bishop Snyder, and they were clapping for him, and he just said, sit down. <laughs> He's a hero. He's a superstar. I'm just by default happen to be here today. I had to say that little introduction when he was talking about the New World Order and the globalists, and I was getting excited over there. I want to hear whoever talks about that. And, uh, I guess it's me. But if I let us begin with the prayer taken from the breviary, the liturgy of the hours that the priest enters into every day. It's from midday prayer. In nomine Patris, Affiliate Spiritus Santi. Amen. As we pray this, let's keep Peter Rose and his family in our prayers. Help us, O oh Lord, to learn the truth thy word imparts, to study that thy laws may be inscribed upon our hearts. Help us, O oh Lord, to live the faith which we proclaim that all our thoughts and words and deeds may glorify your name. Help us, O Lord, to teach the beauty of your ways, that yearning souls may find the Christ and sing aloud his praise. And let us pray. Father in heaven, look down upon your children. Gather here this day. Send your spirit down upon them and fill them with the grace they need to be witnesses of faith unto martyrdom, red or white. Let us be a light of Christ in this ever-darkening world. And we ask this grace in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a word of warning, sometimes people get upset with my manner and tone. I don't think that's going to be a big problem here, but... <laughs> Give you a roadmap of where we're going. I'm going to talk about the state of the world. What does it mean, even, this Russian error that people talk about? If people had to take a test and their eternal soul depended upon answering that correctly... I think there'd be a lot that fail. How has it played out in the world for the last 100 years? What do we now face and, and where is our hope? That's kind of a little roadmap. And as I always try to do, I try to give you your money's worth, but don't get shook if, <laughs> don't get shook no matter what I say, I end with hope. I was in Maryland two days ago to support a candidate that was running for governor. This candidate, Dan Cox, isn't even Catholic. Dan Cox has 10 children, so he's more Catholic than Jorge Bergoglio, who told, us, who told us to quit breeding like rabbits. Almighty God said, go forth and multiply. God bless you, Dan Cox. For the record, Almighty God alone decides when there are too many people on this earth. Not Barack Hussein Obama, not Hillary Clinton, not Klaus Schwab, not Anthony Fauci, not Jorge Bergoglio. Dan Cox's 10th child, a little boy named Caleb, I got to hold I got to hold him. I'm really blessed. Usually wherever I go, I get to hold a baby. You know I wanted 13. Caleb has Down syndrome. He's maybe a year old. And the doctors told him and his wife to murder that baby in her womb. And they said, no, glory be to God, because I got to hold him before going on to the stage and speaking. God bless Dan Cox. He's running against a Democratic Party in Maryland that recently tried to pass a law that would allow infanticide up to 28 days after birth. What that has to do with the health of the mother, why 28 days? You may, by the way, I think there's five states pushing for this. Why 28 days, you might ask? Why, why are there, why not say 21 days or 35 days? What's up with the... 28 days. Because, dear family, Satanists follow the 28-day lunar cycle and they need live sacrifice of babies during that 28-day period. So by getting a law, and it came this close to reaching the floor of the Maryland legislature, by passing such a law, they would be immune from the satanic sacrifice of a baby that was 28 days old or less. By the way, as I said, it should be obvious it has nothing to do with the health of the mother, as C. Edward Coops, 35 years, a pediatric doctor and former Surgeon General of the United States said in his 35 years, he'd not seen a single instance where an abortion was ever necessary to save the mother. It's a lie. There's a commandment against 
lying, against bearing false witness, against the baby in the womb. There's a commandment against it. They count. It's not nine out of ten ain't bad. Don't bear false witness against that baby in the womb. Because God will damn you. And it's our job to tell people that. Not be wimpy pansy like we've been, what's that called, politically correct? (laughs) Over the past 60, 70 years. Some hypersensitive and misinformed people who have not been taught the truth of our faith for the past six years. I think you've probably heard me say it before. I'm sitting in Bishop Callahan's office, knee to knee, basically, and he's getting all upset with me because I preach the truth with vigor. (laughs) (laughs) And I said to him, I've been teaching my people the truth of the faith for four years. And they're entitled to the meat and potatoes, and they want the meat and the potatoes. And he said, yes, but 80% of Catholics don't know right from wrong because we bishops have failed to teach them for the last 50 years. To which I responded, did you hear what you just said? <laughs> I said, I'm tr- you, you just said they, you have failed to teach the people right from wrong for 50 years. I'm trying to do that, and you're giving me a hard time. To which he responded, and this is a quote, I'm very uncomfortable with this conversation. <laughs> So I couldn't make that up, I don't think. <laughs> he, won't, he won't talk to me personally anymore because he knows I can and will use it against him. <laughs> but is that lawyer in me? <laughs> people are uncomfortable with the truth, but I'm not here to make people feel comfortable. I'm here to make it clear that there are two roads. That's it's Jesus saying, talking. There are two roads, the narrow road and the broad one. I'm here to paint the lines on the side of the road so that you can choose which road you want to travel. And if you're trying to travel along that narrow road, you're going to see where not to go off the road. The same conversation with the bishop. It's not in here, by the way. You can tell when I go off script. (laughs) I look up and the hands start moving. So I explained to him there was a case in law school where the road department had failed to maintain the lines on the side of the road. It was a dark and stormy night. A young man missed the, the, the turn, ran off the road and died, and his parents sued the road department for their negligence for failing to paint those lines on the side of the road, and they won the case. So I said to Bishop, I'm just trying to paint the lines, and he said, words to the fact, this isn't a verbatim quote, but it's pretty darn close. Well, I never thought of it that way. <laughs> You know, I'm really at a loss for words, but that kind of stuff just leaves me speechless. I'm here to paint the lines on the side of the road so that you can choose what road you want to go on. And just for fun and for the record, let me state the obvious. You cannot be a Democrat and be a Catholic. I was out with General Flynn. Here I go off the record again. He invited me up to this big event with 7,000 Protestants, roughly in uh, Post Falls, Idaho. And I went up there, you know, looking like this. (laughs) And I said, no, many of you perhaps have heard me say you can't be a Catholic and a Democrat, but I'm here to tell you today you can't be a Christian and a Democrat. And 7,000 people cheered because you can't be. Hear people say, I get, I get so upset. Hear people say, well, I'm just trying to change the party from within. Can you carry the card of a Nazi and then say, well, I disagree personally with Hitler gassing those Jews, but I'm going to try to change the party from within. Can you be a Nazi? No. Can you be a Democrat? No. You don't have to take my word for it. Long before, but certainly since, Pius IX in 1849, this has been the crystal clear teaching of the Catholic Church, 166 years straight, might be 167 now. So so I asked the lady at the front desk, because the computer room wasn't working properly last night at 1.30 in the morning, and uh, I said, could you just print me out the first 10 pages? Because there's a lot of pages there. And, and that's why I, I had other pages that I could choose. Because I knew it was 89 pages long, and there's about three minutes to a page. So that's 270 minutes. That's four and a half hours. Is that, is that long you'd be sitting here? Thankfully, the chairs are comfortable. Anyway, she forgot about the 10 pages, and all of a sudden it started printing them out. And she says, how long is this? I said, I told you, just the first 10. <laughs> Anyway, so I haven't changed the 166. It might be 167 years. Pope Pius IX, Pope from 1846 to 1878, published his encyclical, Gnosis et Nobiscum, on December 8th, 1849. That num- I'm sure that number you all know, or that date. 
Feast of the Immaculate Conception, and this is what he said. Quote, you are aware indeed, this is 1849, you are aware indeed that the goal of this most iniquitous plot is to drive people to overthrow the entire order of human affairs and to draw them over to the wicked theories of this socialism and communism by confusing them with perverted teachings. We knew this on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, 1849. There's no confusion here. He was straightforward in his language. He didn't mince words. He understood, and we should understand, the absolute evil of socialism and the insidious seduction with which it confuses us, not unlike Satan in the garden. Pope Leo XIII, Pope from 1878 to 1903, wrote in his 1878 encyclical, quote, Apostolici Muneris, that socialists were a... Do you know what, you know what the word Nazi stands for? National Socialist but you don't take my word for it. Here's Pope Leo XIII, wrote in his 1878 encyclical, socialists were a sect that threatens civil society with destruction. And 23 years later, that same Pope Leo XIII wrote in his 1901 encyclical, Gravis de Comuni, that socialism was the enemy of society and of religion. So between 1846 and 1901, a period of 55 years, the Pope made it clear, socialism is an evil enemy. If you hear today, oh, some, oh, that's just some modern conspiracy theory, the recognition of the evil of socialism goes way back to at least 1846. We all know Pope St. Pius X, Pope from 1903 to 1914. In 1910, he wrote against the French socialist movement. This is what he said. Listen to his words. The dream of reshaping society, build back better, will bring socialism. But watch, watch what he says next. But stranger still, Alarming and saddening at the same time are the audacity and frivolity of men who call themselves Catholics. And then in parentheses he put Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> Sometimes I just can't help myself. In, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. in dreams of reshaping society under such conditions and of establishing on earth over and beyond the pale of the Catholic Church the reign of love and justice. The reign of Love is love. I don't even think I say it in here, but it's worth saying now. Love isn't love. That's in moron. only a moron says something so stupid. Love isn't love. Love is a crucifix. Love is sacrificing yourself out of love for the other. Love is self-sacrifice, not love is love. A self-indulgent, selfish, take unto oneself whatever one wants. That's not love. Anyway, St. Pius X could have written this in the United States in 2022. Except, as I said, he would include the Daniel terms build back better, which is a euphemism for the Great Reset, which is a euphemism for the New World Order, which is a euphemism for one world godless socialist government underpinning of which would be a novus ordo, a one world religious service. Is not by accident that Jorge Bergoglio went off, was just about a month ago over to Kazakhstan, or Bishop Barron, Jesus is just a privileged way, Bishop Barron? I have, don't talk about it here, but I just have to say it. I, I, because somebody's going to have to cut. I don't know what time. I don't pay attention to that, but I know there's somebody else coming up right after me, so you'll just have to say, okay, that's enough, Father, for one day. Um, the, the life lesson of rat poison. Why does a rat eat the, the poison in the box? Because I used to think as a little boy, it must taste horrible. I don't eat my vegetables. I'm not eating rat poison. <laughs> But as was explained to me by a priest in a magnificent homily, the reason a rat eats rat poison is because like 90% of what's in that box tastes really, really good to a rat. The, the poison's all mixed in there. He can't tell the difference. He gobbles it all down. It kills him dead. Same for our faith. If you don't know your faith, you're vulnerable to the rat poison. You're vulnerable to, oh, that really nice, he's a nice guy. He was one of my, my priest professors in seminary, Bishop Barron. And, uh, but if you don't know your faith, you're vulnerable. Jesus is the way, Bishop Barron. He's not the privileged way. Don't add words to Jesus. Jesus said, quote, in sacred scripture, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Bishop Barron, don't you dare. That is, a, that is heresy. That is apostasy, Bishop Barron. You're feeding your people rat poison when you dare to insert your own word in the middle of Jesus' sentence. Are you kidding me? You're a monster and a miter. You're leading lambs astray. I'll be talking about that. I'll get as far as that at least. <laughs> Anyway, 
New, new World Order, New World Order Mass, which is why Jorge Bergoglio is working overtime through his appointee, Cardinal Roche, to destroy the traditional Mass because it stands completely in the way of the Novus Ordo, the New Order Mass, which will fit nicely, as I said, along with the New World Order. Pope Benedict XV, Pope from 1914 to 1922, wrote in his 1914 encyclical, I don't expect you to remember all this, but what I do expect you to get is a sense of the overwhelmingness of the truth and the overwhelmingness of the lies were being fed by the hierarchy of the church with very few exceptions. Pope Benedict XV wrote in his 1914 encyclical Ad Beatissimi Apostolorum that the condemnation of socialism should never be forgotten. Pope Pius XI, Pope from 22 to 39, wrote in his 1931 encyclical Quadra Jesi Moano that socialism was fundamentally contrary to Christian truth. So we have five points. I've just talked about five straight popes from 1846 before the Civil War to 1939 on the eve of World War II, a period of 93 years, all saying the same thing. Socialism is evil. Then we have Pius XII, Pope from 39 to 58. In his 1952 radio address in Vienna, he said, the church will fight to the end in defense of supreme values threatened by socialism. And finally, John the Twenty-Third, Pope from 58 to 63, in his 1961 encyclical Mater et Magistra, wrote that no Catholic could subscribe even to moderate socialism. So there you have it. Imagine my surprise, then, when some bishops in the United States, the majority, got very upset when I quoted 166 years worth of popes, including two saints, who all said you can't be socialist and be a Catholic. What's your problem, bishops? Thankfully, as Cardinal Burke said at first, he said it best, when I die, I'll stand in judgment, not before, I'll stand in judgment before the Lord our God, not before the USCCB. <laughs> so let's get to the heart of the matter. What is the Russian error about which our Blessed Mother warned us about? The simplest way to understand the error is thusly. Godless human beings essentially rewrite the psalm that says, our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth, to read, our help is in ourselves and our government. Knowing that I was only going to have a limited amount of time, you can see I cross out a whole bunch of stuff of that 89 pages. It's not, there's not time to go into details, but understand that the Russian error, as it was put into practice, was to destroy faith and family. And here it is in a nutshell. Our Christian faith defines each one of us, including Caleb Cox, as the Imago Dei. We're made in the image and likeness of our God. Each of us is uniquely created by our God who loves each one of us as his priceless creation. But in the Russian era, with socialism, no matter whether it's Nazis or communists, it turns human beings into expendable cogs in the machine and thus establishes a very utilitarian approach to valuing humans solely on what they can produce. We see this in stark clarity in camps like Auschwitz. I just visited there for the 11th time in July. The 11th time was as bad as the first. I was telling somebody, maybe it was last night, this time I took my nephew, high school graduation present, and thought I was pretty much immune to that place. Always aware of its horror, but immune. Until I, how many people have been there? until I walked into the room with the little kid's shoes. Right. I started to cry. Auschwitz teaches us what socialism does. Where women and men and children, old folks and the infirm, were marched straight into the gas chamber. There's a big picture on the wall there. And it shows the people getting off the train and it shows the SS officer standing there. And he would, either, as each person walked up before him, he'd point right or he'd point left. To the right, I think it was, meant immediately to the gas chamber. Of course, the person standing there didn't know that. Every old person, every woman, every child, straight to the gas chamber. They had, they had no use for them. If you're a young, healthy man, they would, they'd march you off in this direction so you'd be a slave laborer. They wouldn't feed you until you just emaciated, died, sent you to the gas chamber. Very utilitarian. Well, how did the big guys put into effect the Russian error? It began by destroying faith and family by establishing toxic 
feminism, a toxic feminism which predicated a woman's value based on what she could produce in the marketplace. In other words, a woman only had value if she could work outside the home. Well, in order for that to happen, think Russia in 1917, obviously she could not bear children inside the womb for nine months. So the Russian heir introduced artificial contraception. And should that tactic come up short and she actually did become pregnant, then it was important to, to eliminate the clump of cells. We used to say, you're with child. All of a sudden the word changed. Oh, you're pregnant. You can terminate a pregnancy. Let's try and terminate a with child. Language matters. So the Russian era introduced abortion, murdering the baby in the womb, calling it a clump of cells, calling it a fetus. It's not, by the way, when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, he didn't say you're going to bear a clump of cells. He didn't say you're going to bear a fetus. You're going to bear the Son of God. Well, should that tactic come up short and the woman actually give birth to a baby, the Russian era introduced daycare at the earliest possible age for the dual purpose, one, of getting that woman back to work and two, putting that child at the youngest possible age into family bond destroying daycare, especially government-funded daycare where the child could be indoctrinated directly, intentionally, and even more insidiously in the socialist ideology that devalues parental authority. Why do you think they're trying to teach little kids under the age of puberty? Oh, you, little boy, you think you might be a girl. You're a little confused, but hey, we support you. We're not going to tell your parents. Lenin famously and essentially said, give me a child for four years and I'll have him for life. Why do you think they're putting the little kids that eventually did get born into Russian indoctrination camps called, what do we call it now? Pre-K, Head Start. i talk about that in a second. That is the Russian heir, removing God as creator of priceless human beings made in his image and likeness and replacing God with a godless civil government that puts a price on everyone's head based on what the person's worth is to the government. This whole thing that Obama did, this nationalist socialist health care, well, it sounds like a good idea. I know everybody I've ever talked to said my insurance rates went up, right? Here's what's going to happen. You hit 70, you're no longer valuable to the government. In fact, you're a drag. So we're not going to pay for any operation you may need. We're not going to try to heal you, but you can have a pill. They're doing that in other countries of the world. East, Western Europe has just gone nuts. The Netherlands is, wow, gone. Canada. Canada. Can exactly, Canada. I expect you readily recognize these things from U.S. history, the outward signs of this actually happening here in our country. I remember as if it were yesterday, being in grade school in the mid-60s in a Catholic school, the book, the pictures were black and white because we couldn't afford the color books that the public schools had. And there I was sitting there and I remembered as it was yesterday, there's the two pages open in the book and down here in the bottom left-hand corner was a picture of an Israeli daycare place. At, in Israel at the time, and I think there still is, mandatory military service for all young men and women. And as it happens, no big surprise, some of these young men and women got married and some were having babies. And so the government had to set up daycare. And the story I read in my geography textbook back in the 60s was a study that showed how that compared to children living at home with mommy care, there is no substitute. These children in daycare were failing to thrive. So I'm sick and tired of people saying to me, well, they were to daycare and they turned out okay. Because okay is not the standard by which God will judge any one of us. Okay is not good enough for Almighty God. Jesus did not say, well, I've worked a few miracles, good enough for your salvation, I'm going back to heaven. Jesus went to Calvary. Again, he did, we got to get this straight in our heads. Okay is not the standard. The standard of Almighty God is perfection. As always, don't take my word for it. Jesus says so, be perfect. And for the slam dunk, I love this line. Our Blessed Mother did not shuffle Jesus off to daycare so that she could pursue a career. <laughs> Get it straight, dear family. Daycare is not from heaven. It is a man-made device from hell. And okay is not the standard. I just researched all this. I like to fact check myself. So I researched all this Israeli daycare. Just listen to what I found, a website that boasts. I found this Wednesday. 
So what's what's today? Sunday, right? <laughs> On Wednesday, a website that boasted as follows. This is verbatim. Neamat, the largest provider of child care services in Israel, welcomes 17,000 preschool boys and girls to its 200 centers into a warm, and nurturing learning environment in which they develop the skills needed to succeed in school and in life. Our world-renowned daycare is for children ranging from ages three months up to three years. Recognize, I'm, just, I'm quoting, recognizing the importance of earlier, early childhood education, Neymar pioneered preschool education programs that became the model for Project Head Start in the United States. Do the math, dear family. 17,000 children, three and under, in 200 centers, that's 85 precious children per center. We've known since the 60s that was a bad idea. It's in 2011, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services commissioned a study to evaluate Head Start's effectiveness. Head Start was launched in 1965, so they had 46 years worth of data. And at the time, the U.S. government had spent $180 billion on the program. And at the time of the study, the program was serving over 1 million children in all 50 states at a cost of about $8,000 per student. So over three years, that's $24,000. What'd they get for all that money? The study found that the program had only a small positive impact on children's experiences only through the preschool years. But nevertheless, advantages that they'd gained in Head Start yielded only a few statistical significantly, statistically significant differences in outcomes by the end of first grade. So hear that again. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services found few statistically significant differences despite paying $8,000 per child per year. The study led the Time columnist, Joe Klein, hardly a conservative rag, to say that the study was comprehensive the positive effects were minimal and vanished by the end of first grade. Head Start simply does not work. Listen, every mother, some people don't like to hear this. Every mother who doesn't like to hear it, that put their kids in daycare, you swallowed some of the rat poison. You wonder why so many kids, I've had to, you know, as a lawyer, I had to deal with them kids that were shunted aside so mommy could have a career, kids that acted out and were juvenile delinquents. A juvenile delinquent comes before me in my office, and I don't, you don't need to tell me a thing, kid. I, I can already describe for you your family life at home or lack of family life. I was in Fatima. I'm off, I'm off the track again. <laughs> I was in Fatima. I, was, I took two Monsignors on a pilgrimage, first to knock. Then we went to Fatima. Well, we, were, we arrived after 13 or 14 hours of travel in Nock, and it was 6.30 at night in November. It was cold and damp and foggy and dark, and the three of us are walking over in our clerics to go celebrate the Mass at the Church of the Apparition, and out of the mist appears a lady named Mary. It wasn't her. <laughs> it was a real person. And she says, can, we, can I go to Mass with you? Well, of course. Any shepherd of the church, any father of the church that locked you out of your church during this last two years, what kind of father won't feed his child? Jesus said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you do not have life within you. But I'm going to starve you for two years? Monsters and miters. Anyway, get done with mass. Back to Fatima. <laughs> and uh, she said, can, can you have breakfast with me tomorrow morning, the three of us? So, well, uh, we can't. We're, we're, we've got to catch We've got to drive back to Dublin, catch a flight to to Lisbon to get to Fatima. She said, oh, you're going to Fatima. I have a friend over there named Armando and, and I have some books I want to give him. Will you, can, I, can I at least meet you in the morning and give you those books and you can take them to <laughs> Fatima? Okay. So uh, by the time we got to the hotel in Fatima, there's a note waiting for us at the desk. Armando wants to see you. <laughs> so here's where, you know, we reach these forks in the road and I'm exhausted because as a tour leader, all, it's all, the pressure's all on me. I wanted to go to bed and take a nap, and the worst went, nope, got to go down. Three of us went down. There's Armando. It turns out he's kind of a local legend. He owns a hotel that the bishop celebrates a mass once a week in his 
hotel and he's like the uber tour guide and he was so excited to see three american priests that he insisted we get in his van for free and he took us all around the sites we wouldn't even have seen well one of the sites if you've been there you would have seen was the house of jacinta and francisco so he parts he takes us in and you walk in you know it's right there i mean right there's francisco's bed that he died in there's a little room here and then you turn this way and go to the right and there's a there's a like a living room with them the whole wall is is in a fireplace so Armando walks in ahead of us and three of us walk in me. All of a sudden he whips around and he said, this is what's wrong with the world today. <laughs> well, I wasn't expecting a lesson at that point, but <laughs> okay. And he said, in 1917, the family gathered every day, every evening in this room and they lived as a family. And nowadays, every kid has their own bedroom. Every kid has their own cell phone. Every kid has their own uh, computer. Listen, if you're a parent and if you're a grandparent, you better be schooling your own kids about their grand, your grandkids. You give a kid a cell phone or access to a computer, you're sinning in your dereliction of duty. The, young, the age now, the average age for a boy seeing porn is eight. And you say, well, my kid doesn't have a cell phone. Well, maybe his friends do. The average age is eight. So Armando tells us, he said, this is what's wrong. We've lost family. We've never forgotten that lesson right there in Fatima. By the way, see that picture right there? I had a minor miracle occur to me right there at the, where those kids are. That, that's an angel of peace, giving them Holy Communion. Through a whole set of series of stuff I can't go into because I'm already running out of time, I think. I met an old man over there and... Uh, I won't even go into it. It's just miraculous. Providence beyond measure. I was with two doctors, uh, my, my personal doctors, and uh, I was taking them on pilgrimage. And we took the right and we went up to the top of the hill. We were looking for the angel of peace. And the, one of the doctors, I'm looking at the calvary scene, one of the doctors leaning over talking to somebody. And I'm thinking, who do you know over here and who's speaking the language? So I walked over and this old man and his wife look up at me and they say, are you a Catholic priest? Well, I kind of look like this. <laughs> Oh, I said, come on down this way. I've always wanted to ask a Catholic priest some questions. So you come down back that path and, and I'll meet you at the fork and then I'll take you to see the angel peace and I'll ask you some questions. So we, 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 we had a little photo hop there. Uh, and then as we start to walk down, the first words out of his mouth, remember he wants to ask a Catholic priest some questions. He said, you know what somebody asked, told me just yesterday that the Federal Reserve is privately owned. Well, as soon as he said that, the two doctors looked at each other because they've heard me talk before. <laughs> and they knew what was coming. A half hour later, I explained to him how in Jekyll Island, off the coast, I think it's of Georgia, these eight people, including the representatives of J.P. Morgan and some other, the, the, um, the, the ones that belong to the, that own the Bank of, of Germany, the Rothschilds, they met on this island secret. They prepared the blueprint for the Federal Reserve, model after the Bank of England. And anyway, so I get done with this whole spiel. And, uh, which I've been studying for decades. Uh, and he said, well, you know, where I come from, we call it Jekyll Island because I was born on Jekyll Island and I know the exact club you're talking about where these people met. What are the chances that I get lost, take the wrong path in Fatima, one of my pilgrims leans over, starts chatting it up with this guy and all of a sudden we go down and that's the first question he asks the Catholic priest. What are the chances our Blessed Mother saw to it that that day I was affirmed in all that I say about the evil of the globalists. Anyway, um, oh gosh, how much, what time is it? You got plenty of time. Got, <laughs> well, I'm, paid, I'm, I'm on page 11 of about 19. Oh, so I'm about halfway through. Is that okay? I don't, I don't, okay. So <laughs> just a joke about the time business. So I don't wear a watch. And, and uh, phones are annoyance to me. Um, by the way, I went to, when I went to high school, we had 500 kids. This is what I hear parents say. Well, my kid needs a, a cell phone because if there's an, he needs something or there's an emergency or he needs to call home. I, think it, I went to high school. I had 500 kids in my school. We had one pay phone cost a dime outside the cafeteria and you couldn't hog the line because other people might need to use it. What it taught us is responsibility. I couldn't just call up mom and say, hey, I forgot my track shoes or I forgot my homework. I had to, be, I had to pack my book bag the day before. Be ready. Teach us pre preparation. 
This whole business about everybody needs a cell phone. That's why women have to work to afford all the extra cell phones and the cable and the internet and the, the, the three cars. And I, when I was in school, I had this old rust bucket of a car. And now I look down at the school, my house as a lower was built over the school parking lot. And I see all these kids driving these really shiny, nice cars. Their value is in the car, not in their family. I, Hermano was, was quite correct. Anyway, do I want to... I better t I better cut this out. <laughs> no, I've got to say it. Sorry. <laughs> Jesus said to his disciples, "Things that cause sin will inevitably occur, but woe to the person through whom they occur." It would be better for him if a millstone, the great millstone, were put around his neck and he'd be thrown into the deep blue sea. I put the word "deep" in there. <laughs> the sea, than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So to properly understand what Jesus said there, you need to understand what I call the life lesson of bad. It's one of these lessons that just came to me as I'm trying to teach high schoolers for six years, juniors and seniors who are pretty sharp on their feet. It goes like this. When I was a boy and I acted like a bad boy, I was punished because bad is bad, bad is not good. A few weeks ago, I looked it up. I, again, I fact-checked myself. I really looked it up on the definition on Merriam-Webster. It went something like this. The definition of bad said, failing to reach an acceptable standard, poor or bad repair job or a morally objectionable, evil, bad men. There were actually nine numbered definitions before a new one, number 10, came along, which added to adapt the word bad to an entirely new cultural definition that bad is good. I think of Michael Jackson's album in 1987, Bad, where I'm bad, became I'm good. In short, to understand the meaning of the word, you must know the way the word was used in the time and place of the culture in which it was spoken. Therefore, let us understand the Jewish culture 2,000 years ago when Jesus said, quote, things that cause sin will inevitably occur, but woe to the person through whom they occur. It would be better for him if a millstone were put around his neck and he'd be thrown into the sea than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. Now, most people think Jesus was just kind of only talking about better the person endure capital punishment than lead his children to sin. But remember, we must understand the culture to get the true meaning of what Jesus said. There were many forms of capital punishment in his day. He, didn't, he never said, oh, capital punishment is bad. Jorge Bergoglio unilaterally decided that was the case. Rewrote the catechism. Isn't that special? How many popes have we had? 248 or something like that? It's some big number. He decides that he can just say capital punishment is bad. I could go into that whole thing. I'd take an hour just talking about that. But anyway, but Jesus could have said, better you are stoned to death, which is a horror, than lead my little children astray. Or he could have said, better you are crucified, which as you know is far worse in terms of physical agony and humiliation. But he didn't use those two methods of capital punishment or any other normal methods for capital punishment when Jesus handed down to us his teaching, his directive of just how bad it is for people to lead his children astray. Jesus used the great millstone tied around your neck and drowned in the deep blue sea as his example. Why? Because in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, no matter how you died, by natural causes or by capital punishment, it was necessary to have a proper burial. It was necessary that you properly buried even heinous criminals who had been crucified. That is why it was imperative for his disciples to get Jesus off the cross. They went into the lion's den. They had to go ask Pilate, hey, can we have his body and bury him? Well, see, he says 10 minutes, so I've got to go fast. Okay. Um, which they did. Now listen closely. If in the Jewish culture you did not get a proper burial, it meant that you would burn in hell for eternity. That is why Jesus used the great millstone, not just an ordinary one, but the massive heavy great millstone, which absolutely unequivocally would drag you down to the bottom of the sea where you would not get a proper burial, which meant you would burn in hell for eternity. So connect the dots, dear family. Understand the culture and understand Jesus' words and teaching, what Jesus said that day. Jesus said it would be better for you to be damned by Almighty God to the eternal fires of hell than to lead my children astray. Because they are present-day embodiments of the Russian era that destroys faith and family. Artificial contraception, abortion, daycare, tools of toxic feminism, also that women can find their value not in what Almighty God created them to be, I don't, I just, I can't even begin to imagine what it would be like to have my heart beating right here and my baby's heart within me.
feeding for pretty near nine months. To be able to feed my baby with my own body, to pass my immune system to my own baby. I can't even imagine. But God made me a man, so I got to suck it up. I wanted 13 kids. <laughs> Oh, I'll skip that part because I do have to zip along here. Um, <laughs> feminism. We're drowning in it. Remember Helen Reddy had that, oh, here, I am woman, hear me war. Shut up, Helen. <laughs> Mary didn't say that. She's dead now. Toxic feminism. Well, they bought right into almost like a, a teenage boy woke up and said, oh, I, I, they, just did my, they just made my dream come true. Promiscuity amongst women. How stupid toxic feminists are to not understand what we always knew was true. Men respect women who say no. But again, don't take my word for it. In the secular world, it always was the pretty young virgins who got thrown into the volcano. <laughs> Pagans understood the value of purity and chastity in young women. It's taken us modern society, the Russian heir, to, to think otherwise. And if, if there's a struggle with that, you just have to understand you've, you've been fed some of the rat poison. Feminism is toxic. In the early 1900s, I better go quickly here, in the early 1900s there arose some incomprehensibly wealthy people who endeavored to amass even greater wealth and power to themselves. You know them by some of their mythological names, like... Um, the Rockefellers, J.P. Morgan, the Gettys, Carnegie, Mellon. And in the early 1900s, they bought up controlling interest in the top 25 newspapers in our country because control the media, control the message, control the message, control the people. What have we seen over the last two years? They control the message and they canceled anybody who even dared to suggest otherwise. Understand that they completely control the country now. The whole comprehension of this can be summed up in the confession of David Rockefeller in 2002 in his own autobiography and his own memoirs. He said this, this is a quote, for more than a century, so we're talking early 1900s, more than a century ideological extremists at either end of the political spectrum have seized upon well-publicized incidents such as my encounter with Castro, a communist, to attack the Rockefeller family for the inordinate influence they claim we wield over American political and economic institutions. Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure. One world, if you will. If that's a charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it. It's, it's, not, a, it's not a conspiracy theory. They admit it. Nowhere did David Rockefeller say, my help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. No. Our Blessed Mother warned us about this in 1917. But remember, I, was, I said to you earlier, Pope Pius IX was warning about this in, on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception in 1849. Just quickly, in 2011, 388 people owned as much as half the world's population. In other words, 388 people owned as much as the bottom 3 billion. Five minutes, I've got five minutes, okay. In 2019, that was just down to 26 owned as much wealth as half the world. No matter how you spin it, dear family, the concentration of wealth in the hands of a few is a reflection of the Russian air, where a handful of power brokers at the top exercise absolute dominion over all of us. And we saw that within two weeks, they shut down the entire globe over the fear-demic. Yeah, I better just go. There's so much I could talk about. Just understand the Russian air, global communism, a mere handful of comrades at the top Everybody else at the bottom, and there is no middle class, and that's what they did. Walmart got to stay open. Every small business had to close. They did this on purpose, to destroy us. And we know exactly who has this plan in the third temptation of Christ. The devil took Jesus to the top of the mountain. All this is mine. I'll give it to you if you'll just bow down and worship me. When you see people of power and wealth, you don't even need to guess who they serve, and it isn't God. Anthony Fauci, oh my goodness, the World Economic Forum. Remember Klaus Schwab? I'll go really fast now. Klaus Schwab said at this year's Davos conference, we have the solutions for the world today. Klaus Schwab's dad was BFF with Hitler, who had the final solution. When Klaus Schwab said that this year in Davos, our blood should have run cold. He is evil. They are all evil. Our Blessed Mother warned us about it because she loves us. But understand that that does not mean that we will be protected in our temporal lives any more than she protected her divine son in his temporal life. 
Rather, it means that she will protect our eternal souls now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Remember Jesus said, so we can't complain about the suffering we're about to endure. If they hated me, they'll hate you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. So where's our hope? Our hope is in the name of the Lord. First, always in our doing his will. So the question we have to ask ourselves, am I willing to do his will? I'm down to my last page. <laughs> well, are we willing to ask and answer the question? As the chaos descends upon us, will I offer myself as a living sacrifice and serve the Lord? In other words, am I willing to be David? Remember, God plus one is a majority. Are you willing to be the, is there David in the room? Are you willing to be Gideon? Are you willing to be St. Jose Luis Sanchez del Rio, who at the age of 14, the Mexican socialists, um, tortured him, stabbed him, and as he fell to the ground dying, he traced the cross in his own blood. Are we willing to do that? By the way, if you haven't seen For Greater Glory, the movie, see it. Our hope is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth, and are we willing to follow him to Calvary and to heaven, or are we going to follow the broad road of destruction to hell? That choice is ours. May our Blessed Mother help guide us in all this. And God bless you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. There you go.